The word of the Lord reads, on that last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, with whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Amen. I want to preach, and I guess I got to preach fast at this point. I want to preach, amen. A few folks said, take your time, the rest are rebuking you. Amen. Amen. So, amen. 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 I want to preach to you today from this subject, Living Waters. If I had to give it a subtitle, I would subtitle it, Living in the Overflow. Amen. 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 God put this in my spirit Amen. strong. Amen. Amen. God, thank you for your presence. Thank it's already you, here. Thank you, Father. And I pray that you give me wisdom to preach according to your perfect will and your grace. I yield to you. I decrease that you might increase and be glorified. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Living in the overflow. Amen. Amen. I really want to draw my text from verse 38 where Jesus is talking to the folks here. He says these words to him, to them. He says, he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Amen. Amen. There's a whole lot of things that water does. I don't know about you, but I love to go to the Caribbean and get in that nice blue water. Amen. I, I was raised up on Sandy Point. How many from the DMV are with Sandy Point? Is? Amen. I don't know what you might find in Sandy Point. I, I remember as a young child when my grandmother was living and we would go every year, have a family vacation, some family in the house. Y'all remember that? And we would go to Sandy Point and we would have fun and enjoy ourselves. And you would step in that water, you didn't know what you were stepping on. You didn't know what was floating around you, what was happening around you. Amen. But you have a great time in that in, in that water. But there, there's a distinct difference from that water and when you go to the Caribbean. How many been to the Caribbean? And you get to that blue water. I guess the closest place within the United States that you can get to that blue water is Miami Beach, uh, where it's bluish, greenish. But it's nothing like that clear water. Amen. In the Caribbean, that you can look and just see right through it, straight down to the bottom. That's the kind of water I like to get in. Amen. The kind of water I can tell was swimming around by my feet. <laughs> and and, and, and I, I, I've learned that there's, there's some water where uh, things, some things can live in, and some water where some things just die in. In fact, if you were to take a goldfish and put it in tap water, it probably would die because it doesn't have the proper nutrients to nourish it. Even though the water's clean, it doesn't have the, the ingredients it needs in order to sustain life or get underwater. Amen. Amen. And so God begins to talk to, Jesus talks to these people and he says, I don't want you to just have water. I don't want you to just have sustenance, but I want you to have living water, rivers of living water that will flow from you. Um, it, when you think of living water, there were a couple of places in scripture where the Lord talks about this in the New Testament. I want to take my time for a moment and just teach a little bit right here because I believe it's important for you to understand this so that when it comes time to shout, you know why you shout. Amen. Amen. A couple of places in Scripture, specifically in the New Testament, where uh, Jesus mentions living water. First time you see it in John chapter 4, where he encounters this Samaritan woman at the well. You know the story of the woman at the well. I preached on it as much as I can. I preached on it. Uh, and the disciples had gone in this story in John chapter 4. He, that they had gone into the city and to get some food. But Jesus is here uh, in this land. He meets this woman in Samaria. He meets her at this well called Jacob's well where he, he begins to get thirsty. And at this place he desires a drink. He asks her and he says, give me some of your water. And this woman was, was a little thrown off because she knew that the uh, Jewish men would never talk to the Samaritan women. In fact, Samaritans were hated by the Jews. And so she's thrown off by this. And uh, she says that, uh, why are you asking me, uh, a Jewish man, asking me, a Samaritan woman, to give me some of, give you some of my water? 
The Bible says that in verse 10 of that chapter, that Jesus responds to her. He says, if you knew the gift of God and who it was who says to you to give me a drink, then you would have asked me and I would have given you living water. But he first introduces that thought to us in the New Testament. Are you with me? I need you to stay with me. All right, we're going to shop in a minute, but I need to teach you for a minute. Amen. And early in that chapter, he, in that, in that uh, John chapter, chapter 4, he talks to them. He says, I want you to this lady, I want you to know that there's a water that's greater than what's in this well. Then uh, he, he, they, they're having this discussion about water, and she's on one page, but he's on another. And she's talking about water, referring to the types of water that will quench her physical thirst. But Jesus is talking to her about a water that will quench her spiritual thirst. A water that will give her everlasting life and that will give her an everlasting satisfaction. And so uh, he has to help get her on the same page. And that's John chapter 4. But then there's a second time in the New Testament where we see Jesus referring to this living water. And it's in the text that I read this morning. It's in this text where Jesus is surrounded by Pharisees, religious leaders, people who were looking for the Messiah, but just refused to reset, accept that it was him. They were looking for him to come to them in a specific way, like I just talked about. And because he didn't fit that mold, they rejected him as the Messiah. Now, there's a valuable thought, I believe, and a lesson for us in that little part of the story, in that sometimes we have a tendency to put God in our own little box. Sometimes we expect that he, he can only show up in our lives in a certain way. He can only do it in a certain way. And the reality is that God can move in so many different ways that you haven't even thought of. God can move in your life in ways that you hadn't even anticipated. And it's sitting right in front of you and you're asking God for the answer. And he's saying it's right in front of you. It's just that you're expecting it to look a certain way. Sometimes we have to stop and realize that God speaks in a multiplicity of ways. He can speak to you in ways that you cannot even fathom. So they were looking and they were in this place standing with him looking for the Messiah to come in a certain way and didn't even realize that it was him that was in the midst of them. Then it's in verse 38 when he utters some of the most beautiful words that you might ever hear. And he says, he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart or his belly, some places say, shall flow rivers of living water. Now they're still on separate pages because they hear the phrase water and they think again like the Samaritan woman. Then he's talking about water that will quench our thirst. But he's talking about a different water in this uh, context that they've not yet come to know. Now, when you compare, are you with me still, right? Yeah. All right, I don't want to bore you. I want you to stay with me. When you compare his use of the phrase in John chapter 4 with the Samaritan woman, with his use of this phrase in John chapter 7, verse 38, where he's with the religious Jews, there's two different meanings. In John chapter 4, he's talking about the ability for him to this lady to satisfy her spiritual thirst as she comes into a saving knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. Yeah. As she comes to know him as her Savior. But in the words of chapter 7 verse 38, he speaks to something that's over and above. You need to catch that right there. Yeah. It's over it's beyond what he's talking about in John chapter 4. Another word for that is overflow. It's something that's over and above. It's beyond. It's, it's somewhere that's greater than what they uh, had experienced and what they had known. He's talking about something greater in chapter 7. And, and it's, he's aiming his words at those who are already believers, but who would at one time experience the presence of his Holy Spirit. Wow. He's talking to them and he says that uh, if you believe the scriptures, then out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Well, how do I know he's talking about the Holy Ghost there? Because the reason I know is because verse 39 says, but this he spoke concerning the spirit whom those believing in him would receive for the Holy Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. And so you see here in this verse, he's speaking of what some might call the Pentecostal experience. He's speaking of the experience of those who have been filled, baptized with the precious power of his Holy Spirit. Not just somebody who professes to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, but someone who's come to the fullness of the understanding of what it means to live the Spirit-filled life. 
to our young people, you hear, hear a song oftentimes where there's this rapper talking about I'm living my best life now. You heard that song before, I know you have. You didn't think I knew about that. Some of the raunchiest lyrics you ever want to hear in a song, but they marry it up with some words that speak like I'm living my best life now. Well, Jesus wasn't talking about these words that people say and stuff that people talk about when they just proclaim. How many know that you can speak empty words all you want, but if you don't have the presence of the Holy Spirit living inside of you, your words really mean nothing. And so these people that he's talking to really had no knowledge of who he was. They, they had no understanding of who he was and who his spirit was. And so he's speaking words that are foreign to them. And he said, but there will come a day when I leave this earth and when I leave, there will be someone that I'll leave here with for you to stay with you. He will be the Holy Spirit. Some places they call him the paraclete, the comforter, the advocate, the helper, and the, the, the spirit of truth in different places of scripture. And he says, when he comes, then you will understand what I mean when I say you will have rivers of living water. Yes, Lord. I'm going to preach here in a minute. Just stay with me. He says that when you of the Holy Ghost inside of you. Yeah. You don't live just on the surface, but you live and walk in an overflow. Yeah. There's an overflow of His Spirit, His power in you. You notice the words in John chapter 4. He said, if you knew who was asking you for water, you would have asked Him, and I would have given you fountain, a fountain uh, of water, living waters. I would have given you fountain of living waters. But in, in chapter 7, He uses a different phrase than He did in chapter 4. In chapter 4, He talks about fountains of living water. In chapter 7, He talks about a A river is an interesting thing because it's a water flow that flows with its own energy. What are you talking about, Pastor? This is scientifically proven. You don't have to get in the river and rustle the water to make it go. There's an undercurrent deep down below that causes the river to flow to where it's going. Now, the other thing about a river that you have to know is that the source of a river usually starts from somewhere really high, like a mountain. Uh -huh. You can't see the water flowing in the, under the surface, but it's coming from a high place and it's flowing, and it's literally pushing that river to where it goes. Now, a river is a body of water that actually lets out into a larger body of water, like an ocean or a sea. And so he talks to them about the fact that in their life there should be a flow that's beyond what they can cause to happen in their own strength. Wow. Let me make it plain for some of y'all. So, sometimes we are wrestling and trying to force something to happen. And when things don't happen the way you like to see them happen, you mix that up with the spiritual reality of whether that God is actually there with you and moving on your behalf. But the spirit of God that's inside of you creates what's called a river of living waters that causes a natural flow inside of you so that God's presence will bless you and move in you in spite of yourself. In spite of what's happening around you and the staleness that's surrounding you, the river of living water flows from your belly. Now I wish I had some of y'all already lost you. I wish I had time to talk to you about what it means for it to flow from your belly. The be belly is the central part of the being. It's the place where most people hold their stress. It's the place where your emotion kind of sits and rides. It's, it's the place you, you've never been in a place where you've been tense and frustrated and your stomach gets nauseous and upset. I'm going to preach in a minute. And you get a little nervous inside of you. And you feel it in the gut, inside the gut of your stomach. In fact, medical, te uh, te medical technology tells us that most diseases emanate from the gut. Most diseases come from a place where there's unhealthy bacteria somewhere in your gut. There's a special place that God put for the belly. And when he talks about the belly of the believer, he's talking about that central, inmost, deepest place in you where you hold all of your power. I'm going to preach in a minute. Some of you who are in exercise physiology understand and know that no matter how strong your chest 
may be, or your legs may be, or your arms may be, if you've got a weak core, say amen first lady, if you've got a weak core, it really means nothing. And some folk who don't look strong, because they don't have large muscles, have a strong core. And when they've got a strong core, they're stronger than you think they are. I want to tell you this morning that God says it's out of the core of who you are that rivers of living water will flow. The extremities of the arms and the legs, and sometimes the extremities feel stale and as though there's nothing happening, but you've got to know that in the core of who you are, in the core of your spirit, there's rivers of living water that are flowing. Y'all don't hear me. Can I tell you this morning that God, when he saved you, he gave you the precious gift of his, and gave you the precious gift of his Holy Ghost. From the moment the Holy Spirit penetrated your life, it was God's desire that you would live and walk in the overflow. You meant to live in the fullness of who he is, in the joy of your salvation, and under the divine blessing of his current, the living power inside of you, the power of God that flows from your life. God intends for you to live in that. Amen. Some Christians don't understand what they have living inside of them. When you drink from the well of everlasting life, <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I still get excited about being saved. And then you choose to become baptized with his precious Holy Ghost and the overflowing power of his anointing and the overflow of his grace and the overflow of his peace and the overflow of his purpose become a reality in your life, then you really know what it means to have rivers of living water. My energy may be zapped, but I've got rivers of living water flowing from my inside. If you're not careful, you can overlook the living waters that literally flow from your life. Mm. So one might say, how can living waters flow from my life when it seems that everything around me gets stale? The answer is in how God designed the river. The river has a natural flow that's not caused by artificial force. You can try all you want to artificially force the things in your life. Let me put it plain. The difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is an artificial forcing of something. That doesn't mean it's bad, it's good. But it only lives when it's given reason to. When you take the reason for joy that it, that for happiness, then it leaves, it goes. But joy is a stability in your core. It's something deep in the core of who you are that says, while things around me might be stale, I don't need anything to feed this energy. Now I'm getting ready to preach. I don't need anything to pour into this energy because it has a natural flow. You remember the river, Pastor Lee said the river starts from a mountain and it flows down. It comes from a source that's higher than itself. You see, joy comes from a source that's higher than you. The old folk used to say it like this. They say the world didn't give it and the world can't take it away. When you take away the circumstances that make me happy, I might be sad, but I still can have joy. That's because there's an internal flow in my core that's beyond me. I don't need an artificial source to pick me up and to strengthen me and to build me up. I just need the flowing waters, the river of water flowing inside of me. Some of y'all will get it in a moment. Doesn't matter what you think about yourself or how you feel on the inside. If you're saved and sanctified and Holy Ghost filled, you've got rivers of living water that's flowing inside of you. I love how the prophet Ezekiel 
describes the healing waters. In Ezekiel 47, go back and read it when you have time. Ezekiel 47. He says, the waters was flowing, listen, from under the threshold of the temple. In other words, there was an overflow. And the depth of the water was measured, hear this, four different times he measured it. He wanted to see how deep it was. The first time, Ezekiel said he measured it, and it came just to his ankles. Second time, he said he measured it, it came up to his knees. The third time, he went and measured, and it says that it came up to his waist. The next time, go back and read this, he says he measured it. He said it was water that was too deep for me to walk in any longer. It was water that I could not cross without swimming. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't believe God called you to live in ankle-deep water and ankle-deep blessings. I don't believe he called you to live in knee-deep blessings or waist-high blessings. But I believe God called us to swim in the overflow. Amen. He called you to walk in the overflow of his anointing, yeah. in the overflow of his blessings. Yeah. Ezekiel goes on further to say these words. He says this, he says in verse 9, And it shall be, hear this, that every living thing that moves, wherever the river goes, it will live. Yeah. Yeah. He says there will be a great multitude of fish because the water goes there. And they will be healed, is what Ezekiel says. Everything will live wherever the water goes. One of the meanings of this prophetic passage was to look forward towards the infilling and the baptism of the Holy Ghost of believers. The healing waters of his presence flow in your life. And anywhere his water flows, there is life. And anywhere his water flows, there is healing. And anywhere his water flows, there is hope. And anywhere his water flows, there is an answer. And anywhere his water flows, there is light. And anywhere his water flows, there is light. And anywhere his water flows, there is anointing. And anywhere his water flows, you will have victory. You've got a river of living water flowing inside of you. Oh, Satan wants you to believe that you are barren dry land. Well, I want to give you some theological truth this morning. If I can keep it theologically sound, sometimes you will walk through the wilderness, but while you walk through the wilderness, there's a river inside of you. Y'all can hear that. Because you're too busy asking God why this and why that. God help me through this and help me through that. He says it's okay to walk through the wilderness sometimes. It's okay for the land to be dry sometimes. Because you've got a river inside of you that will never run dry. A well that never dries up. I think it's a coincidence. I don't want to get too theologically deep. Do you think it's a coincidence that in scripture the Bible talks about when the devils and the demonic forces are cast out, that they, they talk about sending them to the dry places. The dry places where Satan lives. It's the place where he tries to lie to you and make you believe there's no hope. The dry place is a place where you believe that God has forgotten you and as though your salvation has left you. But God tells us, he says, look, when I left my Holy Ghost here, he's here to be with you. And not just with you, but inside of you. And if he's inside of you, then you've got rivers of living water that's flowing. And so I don't mind walking through the wilderness. I don't mind walking through the valley. Because I know that I've got a river of living water that's flowing inside of me. Somebody need to hear that this morning. Somebody need to stir up the water. Wrestle up the water that's inside of you. Feeling dry and as though God has forgotten you. And you're not sure just how much higher you can go. But I came to rip the ceiling off of somebody this morning. That God will take you higher. It's not the enemy that's kept you from going higher. It's the fact that you didn't realize that while the wilderness is surrounding you, you've got a river of living water that's inside of you, that you can go high, that you can go in the Spirit of God because of the water that's flowing. Some of us are okay with the John chapter 4 fountain of water, but I don't know about you, I want the John chapter 7 rivers of living water. I didn't come and get saved just to walk in a 
same old mundane, monotonous, daily ways of life. But I came for God to give me a river. You may not see it, but it's there. You can't believe what you see. Your eyes will lie to you every time. Inside of me is a place you can't see. Do I got anybody in the house this morning who will say, Pastor, my core is strong. My legs might be weak. My arms might be hurting. My extremities may seem stale, but my core is strong. You see, a core, a strong core, is what causes you to cry out to Jesus when everything in your life seems to have gone to hell and you don't even know what to do or what to say. Let me fix this for y'all. I'm not talking about hell the curse word. I'm talking about hell the physical place. Sometimes it seems like everything in your life has literally gone to hell. Everything is wrong. Everything is falling down. Everything is messed up and mixed up and nothing seems to be flowing right. But I've learned that it's that strong core. It's the river living water that will cause me to bow my face before God. And when I'm in the place of, it feels like a place of separation, I can give God glory and praise in spite of what I may be experiencing. It's because there's a river of living water. That river will cause you to praise when you feel like cussing. That water will cause you to worship when somebody has backstabbed you and done something wrong. That water God to rescue them. When Jesus was having this conversation in chapter 7 of John. It was actually during a Jewish feast. There was a feast called the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh -huh. Have I've heard that phrase before? That's an Old Testament term. It was a Feast of Tabernacles and, and during the Feast of Tabernacles, the priests would always, listen, they would always bring water as a way to observe and remember what God did for them in Exodus chapter 17. Anybody remember Exodus chapter 17? That's when the children of Israel had left Egypt, but now they're in the wilderness and they have no water. They're in a place called Rephidim. And Moses, because the children of Israel began to panic, he calls on God and he says, Lord, you've got to do something. And God begins to speak to Moses and he says to Moses, I want you to take that staff, that rod that you have in your hand, and he shows Moses a big rock. He says, now stand on this thing, this rock, and I want you to strike this rock. And when you strike this rock with your rod, water will come out. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 17 that while they were in their thirsty place, that God caused water to quench their thirst from the rock. And we remember from our study last week or a week before last that when they were in the wilderness in order to satisfy them with water it would take 11 million gallons of water each day just to satisfy them. That would be enough to fill a train of tanker cars 1800 miles long. So in their place of lack, in their place of need, God rescued them. That's the loving thing and the awesome thing about God. 
is that he knows when you need to be rescued. I want to work with rescue for a minute because rescue is a place that we all come to sometimes. It may be in your wilderness, it may be on your mountain, but there are times when you come to the place where you need to be rescued. Here's what you need to know about rescue. God's definition of rescue is different than yours. Just because you think you need to be rescued at a given time doesn't mean that God thinks that you need to be rescued at that given time. It's when God says you need to be rescued that he rescues you. And the thing about rescue is rescue is a place you come to where God will allow you to be to build some character and to develop some stuff in you. And so when you first start crying out for rescue, usually God will say, not yet. You begin to question God. Why would you let me go through this? He says, because you're not ready yet. The character formation that I need to happen hasn't happened yet. But if you just hang in there for a little while, eventually the proverbial rock, who is Jesus, will come on the scene and begin to release water into your life. Rescue is something that God does in his season and in his time. God will always rescue us in our place of our greatest need. You are assured that he will never leave you to be overtaken. He will always rescue you when you're in your greatest time of need. Psalmist says it this way in Psalm 46.1. God is our refuge and our strength. A very present help in the time of trouble. A little further down there in verse 4 and 5 he says, There is a river. That's that word again. Whose stream shall make glad the city of God. The holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. That means she should not be shaken. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. That word at the break of dawn in English literally means at the turning of morning. Present help. It means he's been found to be reliable. He's been found to be proven. He's a stronghold and he has been in the past. So you shouldn't fear any calamity that may come upon you. We know that he is a God in the present. Preached on that a couple of Sundays ago. He's a God that is always present with us. He's always there. Nothing in your life catches God by surprise. Nothing that you experience has caught him off guard. He didn't wake up one morning and say, I wish somebody had told me that was going to happen. But everything that happens in your life, he's seen it well before you ever came to this earth. He already knew that it was going to come to pass. And when he birthed you from your mother's womb, he birthed you with the ability to stand up under the weight and the pressure of your troubles. Nothing has caught him by surprise. And he always rescues us in our most difficult times. Let me move quickly. The next thing the little water represents is the joy of our salvation. Yeah. Yeah. Some say, Pastor, what on earth are you talking about? Some folks are saved, but they have lost the joy of their salvation. Yeah. Wow. You know some of the pious, dignified saints? They've forgotten what it took to save them. They lost the joy of God coming and rescuing them from their state of lostness. If I can use that word. Their passion for God is gone. Their excitement for what he's done in their life has left them. Their salvation has been reduced to the chores of forced prayer and labored scripture reading, routine church attendance, recitation of buzzwords and church phrases churchy people who really got no rivers flowing in them it's reduced to routine religion all while living a frustrated life a life where there's no real sense of peace or violence can i tell you that god never intended for us to live in religious bondage wow he never intended 
us to be religious people who are constantly frustrated and never enjoy or have the joy of our salvation. Your salvation is supposed to be exciting. It's supposed to be fresh. It's not supposed to be something that you stereotype of what you see on Sunday morning. But you're supposed to enjoy being saved. Enjoy walking with the Lord. You should walk in His power and His authority of the Holy Ghost even when you feel dry. Your faith will tell you there's flowing waters inside of you. There's too many saved folk that ain't happy no more, don't have joy anymore. They know how to say churchy stuff, but they're not excited about Jesus. And I think some of it is because some preachers, some of us, have enabled you because we come and talk to you so much about how to get out of your trouble that we don't talk to you enough about who can get you out of your trouble. I don't know about you, but I never graduate beyond being excited that God saved me. The joy of my salvation. I know what it took to transform my life. I would never be thinking the way that I'm thinking if it wasn't for something supernatural to happen to me. I never want to come to church on Sunday morning. Saturday night would be my playground. Friday night I would be doing everything that I can do. I've only got a desire to come into the house of the Lord and to serve Him because one day I called out to a school. He released his blood and applied it to my heart and transformed who I am from the inside out and changed me and changed my affection and what I value and what I love and what I do. He changed my heart. That is the joy of my salvation. Some of y'all have forgotten the power of redemption. Redemption is going to someone who is sold under slavery to sin and buying them back and redeeming them back unto himself. You've forgotten how much it costs for God to redeem you. You've forgotten what it costs for him to transform you. Do you know that in you there is no good thing that dwells? If he were to remove his spirit for one moment, you think you struggling now. You think things are bad right now. You think that you're frustrated now. If he were to remove his hand from one moment, you would really know what that is. Yes. But because every morning that you wake up, come here first lady. Some of y'all still ain't got it. You ain't even excited to be safe. You waiting for me to say something to make you shout. You don't know you should be shouting just because God came and got your rag in behind and saved you right in the midst of your sin. I know that offended some of y'all because God will take you right in the But the fact is, the Bible says that my salvation without God is just filthy and rats. Rats, rats, nasty, whatever you want to call it. That's what we are without God. But I love the fact that every morning that I get up, while I may not feel like it, I get up with God's hand. Yes, Lord. On my shoulder. The good hand of God is resting on my shoulder. So everywhere I go, I may not feel saved, but as long as his hand is on me. If he were to remove his hand for one moment, calamity would surround you. But I thank God that he always keeps his hand there. So that when the enemy will come in like a flood and try to come against you, the enemy can only go so far before he sees that strong right hand of God. I'm still in the Bible, don't worry about it. The strong right hand of God. We know that God doesn't really have physical hands. It represents the presence and the touch and the glory of God that surrounds you, that keeps you, that covers you. You know I see in the spirit realm, the Holy Spirit just surrounds you and keeps you and covers you so that wherever you go in your life, the good hand of God is upon you. And it keeps it strengthening you. Now, some of y'all really knew what was happening in the spiritual realm, and you could see what was going on around you. You would give God glory just because He saved you. You see, for all of us, it was always the Holy Ghost that was surrounding us. It was the filth of this world. It was the darkness of sin. It was the morning forces that was filling this place that was surrounding us. And we tried as hard as we could to break free from the fortress of sin. But Jesus stepped in one day. I know that you get tired sometimes. But you know, I've just come to the place. God has to help me every once in a while. 
Well, you ain't going to take the joy of my salvation. Amen. Might not have no money, but I'm saved. Amen. Might not feel good, but I'm saved. Amen. Things might not be going perfect in my life, in my relationship, in my marriage, among my children, but I'm saved. Amen. When Jesus cracks the sky, I know that one day I'm going to go and be with him for eternity. Some of us are so happy here on this earth that you've forgotten there's an eternal life and an eternal reward. And that you're not living for today, but you're living for tomorrow. And so life doesn't have to always line up the way I think it should. As long as I know that Jesus is with me and his hand is upon me and that I'm saved, I'm sanctified, I'm Holy Ghost filled, that I've got joy that you can never take away. I might not always be happy, but the joy is always there. You can bring what you want. You can bring what the old folks say, come hell or high water. But the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord keeps me and shields me and protects me and surrounds me. It's his joy. It's his joy that keeps me praising. It's his joy that keeps me moving and keeps me walking. It's his joy that yes, covers me. Amen. Amen. So y'all need the spirit of joy again. Yes, Lord. Because to look at you, some folk will wonder whether or not there's been rivers of living water inside of you. Whether or not the spirit of God has truly transformed you. I guess what I'm trying to do is to help you to see beyond your own mess and your trouble and your circumstances and to understand the reality of what God has done in your life so that you can have joy despite where you are, despite what you're facing. God never intended us to live in religious bondage. In the feast I talked about, Jesus was in this passage. The priest would literally come and they would bring with them golden pitchers of water. Feast of Tabernacles, go study they would bring golden pitchers of water and they would pour it out on the altar as an offering unto the Lord. And they would recite Isaiah 12, 3. They would say, therefore, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. They were reminded of the day that they were brought from the grips of Egypt. And no matter how old they got and no matter what possessions God gave them, they always took time to remember where God had brought them from. It sustained their joy. They celebrated their salvation. They celebrated the saving hand of God. They celebrated where God had brought them from. From hard slavery in Egypt and the barren wilderness where they had no food and no water. Yet God always provided. He, they celebrated when he brought them to the land of promise where the enemies were, were inhabiting the land. But God gave them grace and strength to evict their enemies. They celebrated everything that God had done for them. Can I tell you that God wants you to celebrate. He does things for you to celebrate him. He inhabits the praises of his people. He doesn't just deliver you for you to say, oh, thank you, Jesus, and keep walking down the road. But every once in a while in your life, spirit. You need to stop and build an altar and give God glory and praise and celebrate who he is. They use the feast as a way to celebrate the goodness of God. Psalm 1611 says, in your presence, there's fullness of joy. And at your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. The final thought I want to leave with you this morning. I'll take from the title of my message is that living waters represent living your life in the overflow. Mm. One of the most beautiful things about your salvation is that God intended you to live in abundance. Yes. I came that you might have life right. and have life more abundantly. God wants you to live the maximum flow of his blessings. He wants you to walk and enjoy the fullness of life greater than anything that you ever imagined. Psalm 68, 19 says, Blessed be the God who daily loads us with benefits, yes. the God of our salvation. Some of us look like we're loaded with trouble, but benefits are nowhere around. But I want you to know this morning, God wants you to know that daily God loads you with yes. blessing. He loads you with benefits. Yes. One songwriter put it this way. He says, I am blessed. I am blessed. Every day of my life, I am blessed. When I wake up in the morning until I lay my head to rest, I am blessed. I am blessed. The prophet Joel said it this way in Joel 2.24. He 
says, the threshing floors shall be full of grain, and the vats shall overflow with wine and with oil. Now the thing about overflow and the blessings of God is it involves intentionality. You have to be intentional about walking in the blessings of God. You see, blessings honor and respect your declaration. Just as First Lady preached last Sunday. You have to be intentional about walking in His blessings. You've got to know that when you get up and you put your feet on the floor that you're not walking in the trouble of yesterday, but you're walking in the God who daily loads you with benefits. And sometimes you've got to just speak to yourself and remind yourself that while I went to bed with trouble last night, I refuse to get up and walk in that same trouble today. I'm walking in the blessings that God has given me. I'm blessed in the city. I'm blessed in the field. I'm blessed when I go out. I'm blessed when I come in. Everywhere I go, I'm blessed. You don't feel blessed, but I want to tell you that you are blessed. I know some of y'all don't want to receive it because something's going on in your life, but God just sent me this morning to remind you that you are blessed above and beyond what you can You've got to learn to speak blessings over your life. You've got to learn to sing blessings over your life. Pray his blessings over your life. Ponder his blessings in your life. Declare his blessings in your life. Embrace his blessings in your life. Pursue and run after his blessings in your life. Walk with your head up in the blessings he's given you. Live under the fountain of his blessings. I'm just so tired of making the people of God believe that you don't, you can't have more. God said if you speak a thing, if you declare a thing, it's supposed to pass according to your declaration. I know some people will dub me a faith preacher. Well, I'm not really a faith preacher in that regard, but I'm a preacher who believes that faith works. And that if you begin to speak to your circumstances, and although you've been in a messed up place for a long time, I dare you to begin to get up every morning and begin to speak a different reality in what you want to work with the night before. And you'll see the blessings will begin to follow you. Blessings will begin to overtake you. You see, some of y'all can't enjoy blessings because you're too busy giving power to your trouble. You're too busy speaking force to your trouble. God said, feel that trouble and speak blessings. And when you speak blessings, you'll see the favor of God begin to overtake you. I like the analogy she used. She said, a boomerang. When you begin to speak things, if I can go a little deeper theologically, when you begin to speak a thing, it begins to pull on the heart of God. Why? Because he's a God that responds to faith. And when you speak something, your faith begins to respond. And when faith begins to move, it moves the heart of God. And people begin to move on your behalf. So when you say, God, I believe that you worked this out. I believe you've already fixed it. I believe you've already gone before me. I believe you're going to provide for me. The blessings have got to come and overtake you because you shifted the atmosphere. You need an atmospheric shift in your life. The atmosphere of darkness and clouds is surrounding you. You need an atmospheric shift. Go in your house and begin to shift the atmosphere with your declaration. Oh, I know my husband ain't saved, but I'm proclaiming today that he's going to be saved. I know my wife is acting crazy, but I'm proclaiming today that she is going to act straight and rise up. I know my children have just gone crazy, but I'm proclaiming today that they cannot outrun the hand of God. to work. They need a certain atmosphere. You can't go into an unbelieving place and expect miracles to happen. But when you bring a couple of people together who've got a heart of faith on one accord, it sets an atmosphere for miracles to come into the place. So some of us, that's the only problem we got. God waiting on you to shift the atmosphere. Needs to be an atmospheric change. I don't know about you, but I refuse to let the enemy, or this world for that matter, define my seal. I'm praying with Jabez pray. Enlarge my boys. I don't speak to that spirit that's oppressed. Yeah, it's a spirit of oppression in the people of God. 
You're so tired you can't even worship. You're so bogged down you can't even hear what the preacher's saying. Even while I'm preaching, some of y'all are wrestling with other thoughts and stuff going on. I'm speaking to that spirit of oppression right now that's trying to hold you under his thumb. I'm speaking to that spirit and commanding it to flee. You can live what God wants you to be. There's no ceiling. There's no limit that will come to you unless you allow it to. You've got to speak that God has given you a limit that's his limit, not the limit the enemy has given you. And you've got to change that environment. And refuse to listen to what Satan said. He has no power or authority except you give it to him. And when you give power to the Satan is going, then he has power. I came to rip the power back from his hand. Somewhere the scripture called keys on. Gave me the keys. I may not have everything going the way I wanted to, but I choose this morning to use my keys to unlock the power of blessing in my life. Somewhere he said, try me, prove me. You will see if I won't open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you won't have room enough to receive it. You think God was just wasting his breath? You think he was saying that just to say it? No, he was speaking to people who are oppressed and people who need to hear a word from God. So you need to try him and prove him and see if he won't open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you won't have room enough to receive. I'm speaking prosperity over some people this morning. I'm not a prosperity preacher in that that's all I preach, but that is a part of the gospel. So I'm speaking prosperity over somebody this morning. Songwriter said it's a new season. It's a new day. Yes, it is. Fresh anointing. Yes, yes. It's coming my way. Yes. If you want it to come, you got to say it. Amen. You got to call it forth yes, yourself. Lord. It's a season of power and authority. Yes, it is. Season of power and prosperity. It's a new season coming unto me. I'm speaking that to over someone today who's in a place Amen. where they can receive. Amen. I'm speaking that over you today. Some of you put some ceilings that God never put there because you've allowed life to dictate to you what your ceiling limit is. But I came to rip that off today. That God will open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. You've got to understand that while your well may seem dry this morning, you've got a well that has everlasting life in it. A well that never runs dry. A well of endless hope. A well of abundant power and joy. A well of overwhelming peace. Whatever you need to reach there is right there in the core. All you got to do is go find. A well of healing and sickness. A well of grace for your imperfections. A well of forgiveness for all of your sins. A well of wisdom to answer your every question. A well of restoration for your broken heart. A well of life and secure eternity. God is giving you rivers of living water that flow inside of you. And I want to encourage you as you go from this day forward, that despite and no matter where you go in your life, you will always know that no matter what's surrounding you, that you've got a river of living water that's inside of you. And if that river of living water is flowing in you, it will flow from your belly. As I close this morning, I want to tell you something about this river. The Bible says in Ezekiel, as I talked about earlier, that wherever that river went, wherever it flowed, it brought life. It brought blessing. Uh -huh. It brought help. Uh -huh. That river is not just for you. But that river is for everybody that's around you. That river should flow from you. You see, the enemy wants to put a door on your river so that it can't flow no longer. But that's the beauty of overflow. You see, you can try to put a door and shut me up, but there's so much of a river flowing in me that it's going to overflow anything that you put there. And I've learned how to live in that overflow. Sometimes it's not as much as I want, but I learned how to live in that overflow. You've got to learn to walk in that overflow. The thing that river touches has life. My children don't even know. They might be doing their own thing today. But I released that river. So before long, they got to stand up and line up, get in line. They may not even understand what's happening. But as that river flows in their direction, 
it causes life to sprout, to begin to live in them. There's no reason anything in your life should die. Spiritually, emotionally, there's no reason if you have a river of life inside you. You've got to know how to tap into that core of what God has given you, who he's called you to be. So that you can walk in joy and you can begin to proclaim wow. the blessings Amen. of God. Blessed be God who dead loads us with benefits. Yeah. Living in the overflow. With your heads bowed, your eyes closed. God, I come to you this morning and I thank you for the word. I try to articulate what you've put in my heart. God, it's not by my might or my power, but it's by your spirit. So I pray that this world will find a place, a fertile ground in the hearts of your people. That we become people, God, who understand what the rivers of living waters really are in our lives. That we will be a people, God, who understand that we are to walk with the joy of our salvation. That we be people who understand what it means to live in the overflow. Father, I pray for someone here today who's got dryness all around them. They made the mistake of believing that because they're walking through a wilderness, that the wilderness was inside of them. I pray today that you remind them of the words Jesus spoke in John chapter 7, verse 38, where he says, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Remind them today, God, that while the land may be barren around them, there's a river of living water inside of them. Yes, yes. That waters right. them, that shelters them, right. that shields them, that protect, protects them, rescues them, keeps them. Father, today I pray that you lift the heavy heart. That one that's burdened down, that you would encourage their soul yes. by your grace and by your mercy. Thank you for your grace, there. Father, today I pray that if there's someone who doesn't know you in the full part of this is, that Father, they won't leave this place today without giving their heart to Jesus. Someone who hadn't been sanctified and filled and baptized with your precious Holy Ghost, that God, you might move by your grace and your mercy. We thank you. We praise you, Father. Maybe there's someone here.